Good evening. Let's get started. Uh, I'm Kristen Gilger, Associate Dean here at the Cronkite School, and it's my pleasure to welcome our speaker tonight. I know this is like a special must-see Monday event, which completely messes up everybody, because every time I say it, they go, but it's not Monday. Go, okay, it's a special must-see Monday on a Thursday. Um, but I'm really glad you came tonight, because we have, a, I think, a very special um, a lecture for you. Um, so uh, David Bornstein is a journalist and author who focuses on social innovation, which I'm going to ask him to explain social innovation. He uh, co-authors the Fixes column in the New York Times Opinionator section, which explores and analyzes potential solutions to major social problems. I was looking at it yesterday, and some of the articles that caught my eye were uh, one about a 23-year-old who advocates eating bugs. I thought that was interesting, uh, for all the right reasons. Um, one on Zen and the art of dying, and one on the fundamental unfairness of how kidney donation programs work. So some very interesting stories that are addressing social issues. Um, he also is the founder of Dowser, a media site for young journalists like you who cover social innovation. He has written for the Atlantic Monthly, the New York Times, Newsday, the European Business Forum, the Standard Social Innovation Review, and many other publications. He has books, too. His books include How to Change the World. I love that title. I want to write a book called How to Change the World. Social Entrepreneurs and the Power of New Ideas, uh, The Price of a Dream about Microfinance, and Social Entrepreneurship, What Everyone Needs to Know. He is currently completing another book on social innovation in the U.S. and Canada. But most relevant for us here tonight, he is the co-founder of Solutions Journalism Network, which supports journalists who report on constructive responses to social problems. Um, so that sort of threw me when I first read it. Um, but after uh, talking to David, um, we decided to, uh, to really try to pursue this here at the Cronkite School. We like uh, being guinea pigs for various projects, and we're going to be a guinea pig. We are being a guinea, guinea pig for a project here this fall where um, uh, David has developed and his staff has developed a um, module for teaching solutions journalism that we're using in one of our intermediate reporting classes. And, David spent some time with that class today. And we're also um, using the solutions journalism approach in, uh, in several of our efforts and our beats in Cronkite News uh, on the sixth floor, which is our, one of our professional immersion programs, where they're producing real content and can, really, and can try this in a, in a real life kind of way. So um, to me, solutions journalism, I, I was an uh, editor for 20 years. Um, and often we talked about solutions to social problems, but it would be sort of an afterthought. Um, and I think this sort of just flips the equation and has the journalists thinking about what's the solution to this social problem and sort of using that as a guide for your reporting as opposed to, you know, something that you do on day six of the series. Um, so I think this is a very interesting approach. Um, and one that we're excited to try here at the Cronkite School. Um, uh, David has been described, I have to use one quote because I like this, David has been, was described by one interviewer as a rare bird, an optimistic and forward-looking journalist. Uh, please welcome David Bornstein. Thank you, Kristen. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I was, um, <clears throat> you know, I've been a journalist for, for 25 years. I started off as a, as a reporter for New York Newsday in the early 90s, and uh, then spent um, basically eight, or eight to 10 years covering the developing world. Spent a year in Bangladesh reporting mostly on poverty and health issues and stuff like that. Um, but over the last couple of years, you know, I've been doing this fixes column at the New York Times for five years now. And, uh, with a, my colleague Tina Rosenberg, and we really wanted to see how do you sort of challenge ourselves to see how do you report rigorously in a, in a sort of systematic fashion on how people are responding to social problems, rather than that the problems exist, which is which is how we spend most of our most of our effort in journalism. So this is the we the website that we have created, the Solutions Journalism Network, and the the impetus for this um, this network came about. Uh, 
Really, it was it, something that hit me. I had, I was, my mother, my, my father lives in uh, Montreal, Canada, and my mother passed away a number of years ago. And shortly after she died, I would call him up every night just to kind of talk to him. And he would, he would stay up very late watching the news or TV. So I would call him around 11 or 11.30. And one night I called him, I said, hey, dad, how you doing? He says, and he, I could just feel the heaviness in his voice. And I knew he was, he was sort of feeling depressed after my mom's death. And he just sounded really bad. And, he, and then finally he said, you know, Dave, I'm, I'm convinced that, that human beings are worse than animals. And I sort of took a beat and I went, are you watching CNN, Dad? <laughs> and he was. And um, so this is, so, so we have this, this image of, of what the world looks like. It's mediated uh, through journalism, and which, which by and large is a system that not exclusively, but, but its dominant sort of theory of change is the world will get better if we show it where it's going wrong. And, and so you, you get a lot of what's going wrong in the world, and you get a lot of people whose response to the news is kind of this. Um, and this is all in the in very, very um, noble tradition of wanting to make things better by being witnesses to, um, you know, to the malfeasance and the corruption and the the hidden, the hidden uh, injustices and so forth. Um, but there's something sort of missing in that. So as we were thinking about, you know, what, how do we sort of institute this idea in journalism and spread it in a credible way, in a non-fluffy way, we, um, we started looking at different ways that you could do solutions journalism. What, would it, what does it look like? So here's a very simple example that kind of gives you a sense of it. Um, the Chicago Tribune, was responding to the very heavy toll of gun violence in Chicago by doing this extraordinary, outstanding, and very moving series, which had video footage, it had audio, it had lots of, lots of photographs and text, and it really went into, in, in heartbreaking fashion, the depth, the, 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 um, the level of, um, of pain that gun violence brings in Chicago and the level of destabilization. So shortly after this was, was, um, had come out, um, we were talking with editors at the Fayetteville Observer. Um, we had started this network, and they wanted to do something similar, because Fayetteville, North Carolina, has uh, also a very heavy, heavy, much smaller, but a very heavy, heavy toll of gun violence. But we started talking to the editors, and we said, maybe there's a different way of approaching this, because rather than saying to the community, we have a lot of violence, which is something that they know, maybe trying to mobilize outrage or more, 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 uh, more depth of, of awareness around that would have been their goal. But we, we ended up sort of convincing them to, um, to look at it in a different frame. And they, they ended up launching a series, a one-year series that they called Seeking Safe. And the basic premise of this series was to report on any community that they could find that they had enough money to get to, which was they took their best investigative journalism investigative journalist and they and they basically gave him um, as much gas money as he needed and he b basically drove around the southeast in some north northeastern cities looking at communities that had in some ways increased public safety through some model th that had evidence to prove that it was actually um, helping things out so they looked at for example here they looked at how Memphis had increased its system for responding to blight by 400 percent by instituting um, a model uh, that was much more responsive, and there's a lot of evidence to show that responses to blight by the public, by um, by the public authorities, uh, correlate with better sense of trust in 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 um, in the community and lower levels of crime and violence. Um, they looked at mentoring programs around around the country. They looked at how Atlanta had ref had had um, redeveloped the East Lake District, and they brought they brought back these ideas. Um, in these kind of how done it stories, like this is how this is what they wanted to do. This is how they did it, almost like detective stories, back to Fayetteville, and they did it one once a month for a, for a year. And what happened was it it had a transformative effect. The Fayetteville Observer is a pretty big newspaper in North Carolina. It's it's you know sort of the main the main newspaper in that community. People started talking about these ideas, and the commu the newspaper actually organized, brought together the community community leaders, police, church leaders, business leaders to discuss what are the things that are available for us to do to try to actually create a safer community. Now, they also talked about the violence, and they reported on the problem, but they integrated in all of these stories a sense of possibilities of various things that other communities had done that we could perhaps try here.
And because they injected that, that um, what we say, sort of, our tagline is less tunnel, more light. Because they injected some light into this conversation, it made it much easier for people to engage with it. Because it's very difficult to engage with something that's heartbreaking, um, especially if it, it's, it's adding on to um, many other heartbreaking stories that fill the news every day. It's just too much for people to take. So now there's a fair amount of research, actually a lot of research out there that indicates what happens to people, talks about what happens to people when they are overwhelmed with too much negative information. The Associated Press did a study where they looked at young, young adult consumption of news and they found that one of the you know, main responses were a feeling of learned helplessness. Now for those of you who don't know that term, that was a famous study where rats stopped helping themselves once a stimulus was taken away because they sort of became, they, they lost their sense of agency. And also a desire to, uh, to tune out. It's just too much information. So the idea that you know, the world is falling apart, you go watch uh, Breaking Bad and eat a pint of ice cream, and that your response is not at all what the journalist intended. Um, there's also a fair amount of research on how even the best journalism can have an unintended consequences. And some of the best research in this area is, is, is with the response to climate change, where, where if you look at the, the, the reporting on climate change, it's, it's bad, and then it's really bad, and then it's kind of, it's really, really bad, and we know even more than we did last week. And, and the, the constant sort of amping up, it's almost like a school teacher going louder, getting louder and louder because the kids aren't paying any attention. But you realize volume is not the problem. The problem is that people, the, the, when people don't have a sense of agency, they do tune out. Or they find a way to make sense of what is essentially uh, a, a type of information that they can incorporate in their world maps. So they deny the information or they minimize it. And there's lots of research that shows that that's exactly what's happened with global warming. So this is a problem we're dealing with human beings and, and the way we communicate with them will, will, will determine what they do. So as journalists, there's almost a a clinical effect based, uh, uh, you know, the way a doctor communicates to a patient determines how the patient will take that information. We're, it's the same thing with journalists. We can't forget that we are dealing with human beings who take information in very um, sometimes confusing ways. Uh, there's a big problem too which, they, which, which researchers call solution aversion or motivated denial, which is why do people not want to uh, uh, pay attention to the climate science? Um, well, in many cases, they, they're, they're averse to what they think they will have to do if they agree with that client science. They don't want it if they agree with that, that climate science. So this motivated denial is something that's very hard to get across, and you can't, you can't beat that with just more facts. You actually have to open it up um, in different ways. So one interesting piece of research was done at George Mason University where they, they took um, a variety of people who had different views on climate change, um, ranging from extremely alarmed by it to all the way down to dismissive of climate change. And they set them up with four different stories, or, or, or one story, but four different points in the story. And the graph is how receptive they are to the message they're getting. And the, the O stands for the opening of the story. The T stands for when they describe the threat of climate change. The B stands for when they describe the potential benefits of a mitigating effect of a response to climate change, the potential benefits that it could have. And the C was the conclusion. And the really interesting fact is that even the people who are dismissive or doubtful of climate change became more receptive to the message when the benefits were of, of a potential workable policy were described rather than the threats of, non -action, of inaction. Now, most of our journalism really focuses on the threats. We really focus a lot on the threat of inaction, um, what's going to happen if we do nothing. And very often, uh, we avoid talking about what are the, what are, what's known to be working in different parts of the world, and what are the potential benefits of these policies if we actually invested them more. Journalists are sort of um, reluctant to be future-oriented in that way, justifiably so, because you don't have facts about the future, but they're also reluctant even to talk about responses, about how people are responding to problems for fear of being labeled advocates. And that's kind of a real limiting factor. So 
So kind of the whole purpose of this network that we've started, and we've, we've now worked with about 50 newsrooms around the US, the whole purpose of, of it is to create a, a practice that could become legitimate in journalism. So the idea that you can do rigorous and compelling reporting around responses to uh, social problems, particularly looking at the results that they're producing. So it's as much as possible, it's what people are doing to respond to a problem that's usually widespread and understood, and um, what are the results that they're getting, and what could society learn from this? So it's a pretty basic thing. It's not advocating for that solution. It's not picking winners out of the blue. It's not anything that journalists really shouldn't be doing. It's really using reporting skills to focus on a category of story that, um, that we often um, you know, avoid. So these are some of the newsrooms that we've worked with. Like I said, we've worked with about 50. We've, you know, we've been reached out, the BBC has reached out to us, Le Monde. I mean, we really have, we've been reached out to by a news organization in Bhutan, believe it or not. And, you know, our toolkit, we launched a toolkit about solutions journalism. It was downloaded in the first two months by 2,500 journalists in 100 countries. So there's this real perception out there that there's lots of journalists around the world that are interested in enlarging their, you know, thinking different ways about the way that they could cover the world. Um, so one of the things we do when we talk to newsrooms is we sort of try to make it very, very clear what we're not talking about. And I'm not saying that this is bad stuff, but it's just not what we mean by solutions journalism. There's many, many different ways we, we want to cover the world. Um, but probably the first classic imposter is the hero story. Um, and it's not an accident that CNN Heroes uh, is televised at Thanksgiving time. It's, that's what it is. It's seasonal fair. It's, it's, hey, it's the holiday season. Let's try not to think too much about the world's problems. There are nice people in the world. But it's really framed as this hero is helping the world, the banker flying to Africa, you know, um, you know using, you know, do-gooding wells and things like that. So this is really a very, very different way. And in some ways, it, when we talk about solutions journalism to, new, to journalists, they think CNN heroes and they become very allergic and they think that's not why we went into journalism. We went into journalism because we are truth lovers and we're not boosters. Um, so that's not what we're talking about. We're also not talking about silver bullet stories. This is a New York Times story, sadly, uh, that claimed that this indestructible soccer ball is a life-saving uh, thing. It is not a lifesaver. It's way over claiming. It's a really cool soccer ball, though, I have to say, uh, because if you're poor in the developing world, it's great to have a soccer ball that never breaks. We're also not talking about activism, telling people to go out and tweet and send $20 into a cause. This is, you see this on online news, or news services all the time. That's, that's just another way of you know, getting, you know, that's another thing that NGOs should be doing to raise money and things like that, but it's not really what journalists, we think journalists' um, role is. Um, think tank prescriptions, the opinion piece, you know, talking about how we should uh, uh, fix social security or something. Once again, that's not reporting on a response to a problem, that's, that's an opinion piece, and that's a, prog uh, a prescription for society. These are all the imposters. Um, you see this all the time with investigative series, the afterthought, you can look at the graphic, you know, 95% of it focuses on the problem, and then on the fifth day of the installment, they'll, they, they have four bullet points of things you can do about it. Or if you watch the documentary about the problem, at the, at the end of the documentary they say, if you want to know what you can do about this problem, go to our website. So you see, they, they invest a lot of resources into diagnosing the problem, and then they leave you to your own devices to figure out what are the responses. Now think about that. Imagine if you went to a doctor and they spent the whole, you know, the whole session telling you what your problem is and then said thank you very much and, and you walked out the door. I mean, in some ways we're doing that to people all the time. We're diagnosing the world's ills and, you know, or, or imagine a parent who, who every morning at breakfast said, my job is to point out your shortcomings to, your, to his children. Um, you know, because this is the way that you're going to get better. If every day you're aware of everything that's going wrong in your life and all the mistakes you're making, you will become a better person. We realize that this is not a theory of change that, that really has validity in human behavior. And yet, in journalism, we unwittingly sometimes follow that pattern. Um, not exclusively, but, but um, more than we might care to admit. This is probably the, 
the most common or one of the most common impostors. You, you'll see it on the Huffington Post impact section. You know, where they're now trying to be more rigorous about their solutions journalism. We're working with them actually, but this is the kind of story, the sort of feel good, very nice um, wheelchair for a pig story. Um, Okay, so what are we talking about? So this is a story that Tina Rosenberg, my co-founder of, of the network, did, it, and it's the one that she says is gonna be on her tombstone, so we, it's a great example. She wanted to write a story about the toll that AIDS was taking in 2001. She pitched it to her editor at the New York Times Magazine, um, and they basically didn't, didn't take the story. They said, it's too depressing, no one's gonna read it, we already know how terrible AID, what AIDS is gonna do in Africa. This was 2001. So she did some more research and she repitched the story and she said, actually, there's one country in the world that is, that is providing AIDS antiretroviral drugs to everyone who needs it. At the time, was, it was the only country was Brazil. So she, she switched the story and she did a long investigative piece looking at how did Brazil do this? How are they making sure that people were using the drugs properly? And more importantly, how did they overcome the opposition from the pharmaceutical industries and unfortunately the Clinton administration, which at that time was making it very um, difficult for Brazil to overcome the patent laws and to be able to provide cheap generic AIDS drugs. So this was an investigative piece looking at a major problem that started with the solution and reframed it and it had an enormous impact because it really moved the conversation in the direction of it's possible to provide AIDS drugs to people in the developing world. Um, which is not where people, what people were thinking of at the time. And if you speak to people in the AIDS community who remember the story, they said it was transformative. It changed the debate and it had an enormous impact on the creation of the Global Fund and so forth. So um, the potential impact of surfacing uh, really powerful possibilities um, is, cannot be forgotten in terms of the, the way journalism actually can um, move an issue. So, I've had this experience myself. This is a, um, a column that I wrote, uh, the, one of the fixes columns, and I've, I've written eight columns now that deal with child trauma, because I'm sort of startled at how prevalent it is, how many children in the United States have had serious adversity in their childhood, what they call ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. And so um, uh, I've done a number of these stories, and one of the things is when I, when I wrote one of these stories, this was the, the illustration that the the, um, the Times um, artist used for the story. So you can imagine what, they, what people were thinking of when they think of the issue of child trauma. It's not something that you would imagine would sort of go viral as a story. But what, what I wanted to do is, I wanted people to pay attention to this and I knew I needed to give them an entry point that could get them into the facts of the problem without overwhelming them. So I looked hard and, and I found um, there was one Head Start program that was doing very good work in Missouri in 30 different places where they had created a trauma-sensitized Head Start program, and all of the instructors in the program knew much better how to deal with four-year-olds when they were having these trauma traumatic reactions. One of the statistics that I discovered was that children in daycare programs are expelled, expelled, this is what they call it preschool expulsions, at anywhere from 13 to 30 times the rate of K to 12 expulsions. So basically you have a four-year-old who's biting other children or hitting them over the head with fire trucks or unable to manage his behavior, usually because he, he has had a traumatic reaction or a very difficult early childhood situations. Self-regulation is often um, one of the things that gets inhibited. And the teachers can't deal with this child. This child literally gets kicked out of the daycare program and very likely won't do very well in school for the rest of his life. So the teachers were, were trained, how do you deal with this child? How do you teach them to actually learn how to calm themselves down? And it turns out you can do this. There's a lot of research that this is a doable thing. But this was the thing that was really fascinating. Teaching children to calm themselves, the solutions journalism version of the trauma story, was number one most emailed, number one most Facebooked, number one most tweeted story on the Times for a week, right? So, this is kind of sad because it means that there's a lot of people for whom this story is very relevant, which is too bad. But at the same time, it meant that it got a lot of traction and people were able to hear about the, le the problems in a way that my goal was to make people aware about the problem, to make them perhaps outraged about it, but also to understand that there are tools and things that we can do about it so that if they're in a school or a health program or if they're parents, they can actually look for and think that there are things out there to look for. 
So, and I was really surprised at the, the difference, because if I had told the story in the traditional way, I'm sure it would have come and gone very quickly. So, uh, one of our partnerships is with the Seattle Times, and one of the things that um, you know, we've done with them, they've been doing this thing called Education Lab for two years, which is looking systematically at many of the problems in public education and various ideas that are surfacing in Seattle or around the country to try to grapple with those problems more successfully. So this is a story about a, um, a school that transformed itself over a four-year period to having a very high graduation rate. This is a school that was a dropout factory and it was enormously successful. So this is a school turnaround story, ma amazing story, but what they did is they, they wrote a, a how-done-it story. They really looked at how did a school go through this process. And if you read this story, it kind of reads like an episode of CSI, like watching CSI or House. It's, or, it's one of those TV, what they call for, for, um, procedural shows, where you, you kind of know at the beginning they're going to solve the case, they're going to save the baby, whatever, but you're fascinated by the forensics of it, by how they actually did it. And the story is driven by curiosity, by that, and we call these stories how done it's. They really do read like detective stories. And the interesting thing is, when you write them, they're not wonky education stories that nobody pays attention to. People read them because they're curious. They, we love engaging with people who are trying to solve problems. Our brains actually naturally join with them when we, when we read about someone trying to solve a problem. We begin empathizing with their problems. And when they have struggles and obstacles, we empathize even more with them. So that's the, there's a great narrative potential in these stories. The, um, the other thing that's really interesting about the solutions journalism model that, that Seattle figured out was the solutions or the, the, really good, the best ideas for your particular problems may not necessarily be in your city. It's unlikely that the best models are in your city for anything. Um, so they wanted to look at this issue of parent engagement in public schools, which is a big problem in South Seattle. Um, but they couldn't find anything really significant that they felt had the evidence and track record to report on. So they enlarged their scope and they looked around the country and they found a tremendous model um, or terrific model working that had a lot of evidence and track record in Chicago, the Logan Square Neighborhood Association. So um, they went to Chicago, reported what they're doing in Chicago and brought it back like Marco Polo bringing, you know, spices back to Seattle and said, hey, there's, here's this really interesting model in Chicago. They localized that story and said, this is, what we, this is something we should be reading about for consideration about ideas for parent engagement in Seattle. People were, were really interested, educators were so interested in that they created an event and they actually flew people from Chicago to Seattle to describe on stage in an interview for 170 people who attended how exactly they had done this thing. And, and it was fascinating because it, it got the people, people, usually when you have education um, events around public education, you have these, you know, these fighting matches between the charter school reformers and the teachers unions. They literally hate each other and they will argue till two in the morning. At this event, they talked, it was a practical conversation about how do you actually do this? And at the end of it, you know, out of 170 people, more than half of them gave the conversation a five out of five rating or a four, and everyone was, almost everyone was over four. So it was very positive reaction from the community about tabling a conversation that was essentially focused on, on that conversation. We, we've also done studies, or the, this was done by the, uh, the Engaging News Project at the, at the University of Texas. Um, we took three stories, one about child trauma, one about chronic homelessness, one about poverty in India. We took a normal problem-focused story, and then we adapted that story and added a response, not in the headline, not in the lead, but a little lower down, to, to solutionize the story a little bit. And then we randomized 750 people and asked them, how do you feel? Would you share this? Do you want to read more stories from the newspaper? Do you want to get engaged in this issue? We asked them 20 questions. In every single one of the 20 questions, the story that had a response in the narrative was rated higher. People wanted to share it more. And most of these responses were, st were significant at 97 or 99 percent. So this was a qualitative difference in the way people, and these were, once again, these were difficult, sort of negative, hard edged stories. So we've seen this too from the journalists. We've now engaged with. Uh, over a thousand journalists around the United States and then through, through the network around the world a lot more. Um, 
And this is the kind of response that we get, you know, from Claudia Rowe. Never in 23 years of reporting have I written a story that's generated such consistent um, and powerful reaction. So this is from a journalist. You know, Claudia had covered gang violence in Seattle. She is not a softball person. Um, and she has, you know, she spent two years doing the education lab and came back to us over and over again saying, I'm getting responses from the audience and from readers, from legislators, from the governor. I mean, people all over the place were responding to these stories in a way that really surprised her. And that's one of the reasons why that this one year project is now in its third year at the Seattle Times, because it's, the, the, the journalists have gotten very excited about the, the, the potential. So, so basically, you know, if you, if you really sort of boil down solutions journalism, it, 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 um, it really does come down to going a little bit further than when we normally stop, um, you know, as journalists, uh, which is to say to remember to ask the question, when you are covering a problem, is somebody doing a better job against this problem? Who's doing better against this problem? And you can ask, you can, and, and also developing sources who have the answer to that question, because they're often very different sources than the ones we normally cultivate. Um, and also, you know, uh, you know, thinking about the possible solutions angle to any story. So for many breaking news events, the next day story could be a really interesting follow-up story. And um, we do this all the time in our fixes columns. You know, if the if, if everybody is looking at immigration in a certain way, we'll come out and say, here's a couple of communities that have done a great job absorbing their immigrations. They've, immigrants, they've created welcoming committees, and in one case, Dayton, Ohio, they sent somebody act, actually to go all the way to Turkey to figure out how they can make Dayton a more welcoming com um, community for Turkish immigrants, right? So you can actually, you can always find people, if there's a widespread problem, you will always find creative individuals, creative groups that are responding in really fascinating fashion to that problem. And that is often the fresh angle. It's what no one else is reporting on. And you can come in there with a fresh angle. It's, also, it's often surfacing information that's, that's kind of exciting. When I show this slide to, um, to journalists, there's, there's a real, break between the, the younger journalists who have no idea who this person is and the older journalists who remember. Uh, so this is, how many of you remember Columbo? Put up your hand. There's a handful, there's a handful. So Columbo used to talk and talk and talk. And at the end of his interview with, he was a detective, he would. I'm going to go very quickly just to give a kind of sense of how we can do, of how we can look at, uh, at, the, at the world and be able to find these, uh, these stories, which, you know, we say that the problems scream, but the solutions whisper. There's always someone clamoring for you to cover a problem. A shooting has to be covered. When the water main breaks on, on Main Street, you have to cover it. But this, this interesting response that's been developed is often a quiet story. People are not insisting that you cover it. So those stories often go missing. The way to find them is often through research and data, because there are people who pay attention to this stuff. So for example, this is a map of um, increases in physical activity in the United States between 2001 and 2011. It comes from the Institute um, for Health Metrics and Evaluation, the largest repository for health information in the world, actually. And if you look at the, the blue and purple, that is the state of Kentucky. So the question is, when these guys looked at the map, they said, what's happening in Kentucky? in Kentucky? What did they do to increase their physical activity more than, as a state, more than any other state in the country? This is what we call a positive deviant. Nobody really knew. I actually sent this map to the editors at the Lexington Herald Leader to see if they, they could figure out what had happened. Uh, but to my knowledge, no one has figured out what actually happened in Kentucky. The researchers still don't know. So it's an interesting question. We see this all the time. Um, Here's, there are two Good Samaritan hospitals around New York City. Um, one of them has a 50, almost a 50% cesarean rate. This would be a classic watchdog story. It's, this is unconscionably high. They shouldn't have that. What, what, what are the, why, are, why is it 50%? Um, and then there's this other Good Samaritan, which has you know, an 18% rate. So you would look at this and you'd say, this is interesting. Um, maybe they have completely different demographics, and that accounts for it. Maybe one is a teaching hospital. Maybe that could account for it. We don't really know what the issue is. But chances are, if you look at both ends of a spectrum, 
uh, in a database, you will find differences in practices, and very often you'll find that the people who are responding to problems better are doing different things better. They're, they're doing something that's usually smarter, and the story about how they're doing it, how they made those changes, how they retrained, do they have a midwifery unit, I mean, whatever they're doing is a really fascinating story, especially if it's in the context of a big public health story around the rates of cesareans and certain communities and so forth. So most journalists will look at, at, at they'll look at the database that shows them the problem and they'll stop there. Um, but we're finding that, you know, the impulse to also look for the positive deviants and then look for the contrast and report on both of them is something that often has to be, um, you know, rewired into people. Um, this is an interesting story about how Meg Kissinger at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel wrote a very big investigative piece called Chronic Crisis about the city's mental health problems and the way the police handled the city's mental health problems. Um, she looked broadly around the country for places around the U.S. that were doing better and she found that Houston had actually reformed its police department around this particular issue and had very good evidence that this was making a huge difference. Um, I don't know if a huge difference, but a substantial difference in the treatment. So she went to Houston and she brought this idea back to Milwaukee and said, you know, there are things we could do a lot better. And this had a very, very big effect. Not only did Chronic Crisis win the Polk Award, but it led to um, essentially a restructuring of, uh, of the city's system. Uh, it put a lot of pressure on the government. Um, there's a couple of other very simple ways to do this story. Um, this is an example of Keegan Kyle at the Orange County Register. They were looking at the way um, their community, Santa Ana, was dealing with prostitution. They found that Anaheim was doing it completely differently. Anaheim was punishing the Johns. Santa Ana was punishing the prostitutes. So they reported on that. They also found other cities that were doing similar things that instituted John schools and things like that. That this story led um, to a change in policy around this issue. So rather than just reporting on the problem, also look to see if there are better responses in other communities. So um, right nearby. Um, this is, um, you know, you don't always have to have conclusive evidence. There's often people who are trying big new things. You can just report on them. They don't have to, they don't necessarily have to have a great track record. The point is, is not to overclaim uh, beyond what the evidence shows are doing. And, and, and to promise readers that you'll come back or viewers, that you'll come back to this when more is known. So you can cover things in real time. You don't always have to have a, a big study that validates everything you're doing. There's, the world moves too quickly for that. Um, this is, once again, Tina's article. Tina Rosenberg's article was essentially an investigative piece, but she began with the solution to, essentially, the, the purpose of a solution in an investigative piece is to show people that it's possible to do better and essentially to make your watchdogging have even sharper teeth. Because when it's possible to do better, it takes away excuses. And that makes it very hard for people to, to um, it makes further inaction less legitimate. It makes it harder for people to hide. And, um, and finally, these stories can be done very quickly. I mean, a lot of these stories don't require a huge, this was a, one of those newspapers that they give out in the subway, AM New York, they had a fantastic solution story in 576 words about the bed bug problem in New York City. And so everybody knew about the bed bug problem. They didn't have to explain what a bed bug is and it gets into your sheets and all that stuff. So, um, and it was, you, know, so you can do these stories quickly. You, they, don't have, they don't have to be long enterprises pieces, pieces and so forth. So, um, so finally, just to conclude, there's, um, there's a real kind of big idea behind this stuff, which is, and this, this is a quote from Marshall Gans, who was, who was the community activist who was one of the people of the, who was the architect of Obama's first campaign. And um, this is something I, I heard him speak once, and I heard him say this, that we need, it's a recognition of the world's problems combined with a recognition of the world's possibilities that creates the conditions for change. It's by putting those two things together that really activates people. And, um, and so this, that's sort of the point of this, uh, this, this uh, trying to integrate this approach in journalism is to really see if, if we can do something a little bit different that has more of an activation possibility. Um, so this is, a, we have a newsletter called The Solutions Three, where every week we, we look at three solution stories that we think um, are good and talk about um, why they work. So it's a good learning tool. And we have a whole bunch of toolkits on our website, uh, solutionsjournalism.org, that talk about um, 
you know, what are, you know, editor, you know, solutions journalism for editors, for education reporters, for general reporters, and we'll be launching a network pretty soon uh, and providing a lot more tools for journalists around the country and the world, as well as for newsrooms. And the idea is that this is a, this is a, should, you know, we, we'd like to see this become part of journalistic practice so it becomes part of the balance that people seek to, to achieve. When they think of balance, it's not just ideological balance, it's not just do we have, are we covering uh, uh, race, racial or, or ethnic groups with balance, but are we actually providing information in a balanced way that captures both the possibilities, both the threats, and also the opportunities and the possibilities so that people can have a, a faithful and accurate view of where we stand vis-a-vis -vis any issue at any point in time. So this is my, this is my email. And uh, thank you for listening. We are very, once we launch this, this network, which is probably in about six weeks, uh, the website and all that, we would love to hear from you if you are doing, interested in this practice or if you want to uh, talk about stories or if you have done a story that you think is something, please send it to us. We will tweet about it and blog about it and try to draw attention to it and add it to the database. We now have close to 1,000 stories of uh, solutions journalism sort of mapping out around all sorts of problems. It's really a fascinating collective resource. So thanks for your attention, and I would love to hear any questions, concerns, critiques, whatever. Thank you. And so you're journalists. You have to have questions. Any uh, broadcast uh, stories that you or some people that you know have done in this field, and like ones that have aired on television? Yeah, sure. We um, <clears throat> uh, we actually we just co-produced one with PBS NewsHour just uh, about uh, two weeks ago or a week and a half ago. And so if you if you um, if you want to just Google it, Google PBS NewsHour um, Medical Legal Partnership. And uh, and you'll see the segment. It was it was like an eight-minute segment about a very interesting model for um, helping hospitals respond better to poor people's needs when the problem is more of a legal need than a health need. Like for a kid, like for example, an a, a child who's asthmatic, where the asthma trigger is perhaps um, cockroaches or the landlord won't let them install an air conditioner or something like that. Where the le there's a legal solution to a health problem over the years. So you could go, you could just Google Fred de Sam Lazaro as well. Behavior change is a hard thing. You know, I, I think that there's a couple of things. Um, so, so not so much that they object to doing this. It's first of all, everyone's on the hamster wheel, you know, of coverage. The problems are always screaming. You always have to come. Behavior change is a hard thing. You know, I, I think that there's a couple of things. Um, so, so not so much that they object to doing this. It's first of all, everyone's on the hamster wheel, you know, of coverage. The problems are always screaming. You always have to cover these things. Um, the solution stories often take more time to research because you don't want to, you know, there is this sort of professional bias in journalism, um, Tina. But to be overly gullible is a felony. So people tend to want to really put in a lot of effort when they do these stories and make sure that they're not um, potentially holding up an example as a, as a model when in fact it's corrupt or the data is fake or something like that. So, but basically it's really, I would say news organizations are, I mean there was a study once done and they described the two most defensive environments, de defensive work environments, and they were air traffic controllers and newsrooms. <laughs> so. <laughs> These, they're very defensive environments. There's a lot of fear about what's going to happen in the future. Change is hard. Old habits die. You need more time and space to do this. You often may have to forego other kinds of coverage that you think is necessary, your daily stuff, in order to devote more value-added or higher-value stories. Um, and then there's often just the leadership. You know, Where there is leadership and there are editors, oftentimes these projects happen. Where there's not, they don't. Yeah. But I totally agree with you, by the way. I think this is a no-brainer. And I think it's a business. You could make a very good business case that you've got to try something new, and here's something that 
uh, really is promising. So, uh, you know, it, but it's, it's, uh, it's been a little bit uphill. You described that process as being somewhat difficult for seasoned journalists. Now, me being a freshman here at Cronkite and hearing that you're going to try and integrate this kind of thought process in our education, is that something you can see your company moving more towards, the education side of journalism, as opposed to integrating in an established newsroom sort of field? Yeah, we hope to. That's why we're here. We're a nonprofit, so, and that's, that's why we're here, you know, piloting. This is the first module in any journalism school on solutions journalism. Uh, that we know of in the United States. So this is this ground zero. Well, I shouldn't use that phrase. This is, uh, you know, this is the Model T Solutions Journalism site. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it, it should be integrated in, in the way journalists think about things. And there will be dimensions in broadcast and dimensions in radio and dimensions in print. And, but ultimately, I think down the road, the real thing that's going to happen that's going to make this much more doable are um, uh, sort of um, places um, uh, data, data sources uh, that have um, lists of sources, lists of places where you can look at the data in creative ways, lists of researchers, because finding these stories um, and knowing which ones are credible um, requires different sourcing. You can't just call up someone from the Department of Education and say what's working. You're not going to get. You really have to find the researchers who understand um, you know, and are really looking at the ground level of often what's happening at the community level that's innovative. So. Figuring out the sourcing of this um, is one of the big challenges, and I think that's where research and uh, the young journalists can sort of create their own sources and perhaps, um, you know, sort of collaborate in building some of those tools. Thank you. Hello. Hi. In Europe, uh, your approach is called constructive journalism. At least it seems in Europe, similar. Yeah. Yes. Have I you just heard got an it? email from. Sorry. I just got an email from Catherine today, Catherine Gildenstadt, who's. So we are friends. We are, and you know, we are con cons co-conspirators. There's also something in journalism called positive news, that framing, and there's something called impact journalism in France. Some of the framing is a little bit soft and puffy. But constructive journalism is rigorous. That's the, that's the movement in Europe that we find most congenial. Oh, absolutely. That's, that's the biggest risk, is puffy journalism. Our, our biggest risk is not no solutions journalism, it's bad solutions journalism. So how do you avoid it? Well, you know, all the things that we talked about, you, you, you're, you report on how somebody or some group is responding to a problem, what are the results that they're getting, and how are they getting them? Okay, so you're not, and, 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 and you explain in your story why you're, why you're picking this particular example. So, you know, you don't just write about a nice social organization because you met the person at a party the night before. You, you look and you say, there, there may be 10 organizations in our state who are trying to reduce the dropout rate. Which one should we write about? Let me ask you the other question. If there were 10 schools in this state that had a terrible dropout rate, which one would you write about? You know, Which one would you focus on if you wanted to do a watchdog story? You might focus on the worst. You know, say, that, yeah, they have the, the worst problem. They're the, they're the ones who are the most negligent. So by the other token, you'd look at the ones who are trying to solve the problem and say, they seem to be getting the best results. Or they're working with a demographic of students that's particularly needy. So we're going to focus on that one, because that's a very low resource school, and they have a real problem. You justify the, why you're writing the story, and you explain you're writing it because they're getting these results, and so forth. Um, so you, you move away from this idea of advocacy. But the main thing is not to overclaim. It's, it's really just reporting. It's really just good journalism. You're just reporting on what, as best as can be ascertained, is knowable about what people are doing and trying to elicit what can be learned. The main thing that's, the, there's no hero in these stories. If there is a hero, it's an idea. The hero is the idea. It's the method. It's not how great this nonprofit is or how charismatic this visionary is. That's all the hero stuff. Um, so that's really the way you avoid you avoid the advocacy problem. Is that uh, clear, by the way? Because that's a big question. Okay. <laughs> 
So a lot of your examples were from newspapers or news platforms that already have a huge audience. But so say we're working on this as students, even if we do great work, it's hard to get people to see it sometimes. So how do you suggest like getting our work out there to get more people to see it? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, <clears throat> so in many cases around these stories, there are already communities um, of interest. There's a very, very large network in the United States that cares about education and that cares about trauma and that's looking at children's mental health. That is why that story was the most emailed story. Once one of these people got it, it went to 10,000 people who all care about mental health of children and they sent it to each other. So I think that there's very, very strategic ways that you can go about using social media and email lists to reach out to communities of interest around stories that add value for that community. So if you're, re you know, if you're reaching out to, if it's a story about, um, you know, I, I, I wrote a story about a company from Denmark that had developed how they did a it. really interesting um, model that story for employing went, people Also went viral. Because I know it reached people in that community and the parents and the educators and all the nonprofit organizations and all the foundations, all the people and the policymakers who are focused on that issue. Um, so I think that what you can do is really try to find who are the people who really care about the information that I'm surfacing here, who will find it really valuable, and let those people move it in their networks. It's those, it's those communities of interest that are very powerful now, and it's so much more easy to access than they were 20 years ago. Thanks. Uh, my name is Noah Weinberg. I'm a uh, Journalism 301 student. Um, my question is, how do you decipher between um, multiple solutions that are that are effect, effectively doing the same thing, but like at different rates or different paces, but may be doing like very similar things. How do you decipher between like which solution is the solution? No, oh, you don't. You, know, you never say that this solution is the solution. That would be we would be totally opposed to that. The, I, there's no best solution. Every solution has particular strengths and particular liabilities or, or limitations. Some, some, very often the best solution is a Rolls-Royce solution that, that will never scale and has no political, no political uh, opportunity to, to, to become policy. Um, so you're always looking at weighing, you know, you know, you know it's, it's the same thing with the schools. That, that have a, that if you were going to write a watchdog story against the police department for, for racial profiling or something like that, which police department would you, would you focus on? You'd focus on the one that's you know, that you think for various reasons is, illustrates the problem. So in this case, you would focus on one that illustrates something that's teachable about how to, how to address this, this, this problem in a better way. You may do two stories, or you may report on one of them and say there's also another model like this and sort of, you know, it, does, it doesn't have to be the best solution. In many cases, the, a story about a response that's not fully successful or not even successful at all can be a very good solutions journalism story because it, you've often learned from failure. Um, or you may often find that you know, they're, they've done really, really well with some piece of the problem, but they're still really struggling to try to figure out you know, the second part of the problem. That's, that's actually what you find most of the time. Most stories are, they're doing something really well and they're doing a bunch of other things not that well. And so you have a kind of mixed bag and it's a nuanced, nuanced story. It's always, it's always that. It's, it's always ultimately a judgment call where you think the best, it's where you think the best and most interesting story is, where you get the access, where people have compelling stories and anecdotes to share. You know, it's, it's ultimately still journalism. You have to be able to talk to people and get them to look good on camera or whatever the thing is that you need to do. It's not just, you know, there's many factors that lead to a good story. Thank you. Hi, I was just wondering if you drew Thank you, yeah. Uh, if you drew inspiration from other models during the creation of the Solutions Journalism Network, if there was ever, uh, let's see how to word this, if you ever looked at successful networks kind of doing the same thing, or if you were kind of the first or the Behringer of this type of journalism. You know, I think that this has been around forever. Right. You know, people have been, you know, reporting uh, this way. I mean, the person probably, the single journalist who has most inspired us in this in this uh, undertaking is Atul Gawande, who, who uh, I was sort of surprised when I was speaking to some journalists before who didn't know who he was. So he's, he's, I think, the best health reporter in the country. But he has 
brought solutions journalism to a very high art form to the point, I mean, I remember, I started reading him, I don't know how many years ago, 10 or 15 years ago, I don't even know, but he was really very much an inspiration for, James Fallows was very much of an inspiration. I read his book, Breaking the News, years ago, and I thought that his critique was right on the money. He tried to do something like this years ago at, at the US News, and News, News and World Report. Um, so there's lots of people who have tried to do this stuff. There were. We don't, one of the things that we say is it's not a movement. There, there was civic journalism. There have been movements in journalism. We're not claiming at all to be a movement. This is really a practice. It's another tool. It's a very valuable tool in your tool belt. That's all. So we're not uh, trying to overclaim around that. Awesome. Thank you. Are we good? Yeah. Oh, oh, well, I think we have. Can we do one more? Sure. Did you? Yeah. So you can you, yeah, can you go there so everyone here? Yes. Sorry, this last question. Thank you very much. So you mentioned that there's a lot of data, the data sources are where you pull your stories from because those are... Correct. How do you find the credible data sources versus maybe those that aren't as accurate? And where do you... How do you... What's your process for checking that? Okay, so there's, there's two things. One is the, the deep thing to do. And the other one is the more doable thing to do. So I, I used to teach statistics. I love data. So I just, I'm good at data, but not everyone is. So, but I also have a lot of sources out there who, when I'm trying to make sense of research, I don't really trust my ability to understand the regression that they've done or to really understand. There's a lot, you know, one of the biggest problems with research is something called publication bias. More papers get published if they produce a positive result than if they don't. It's a terrible bias. It means that if you show no effect, your paper doesn't get published. So all of the studies that show that this thing isn't working don't get published, but the few that show that it is working do get published. So it's a terrible bias in research. It's why many more drugs get, get you know, it, it leads to all sorts of distortions in, in, in reported science. So what I do is I have a list of sources of people who I think are very um, truth loverish kind of people, and I call them up and I say, can you look at this study or can you suggest some studies around uh, homelessness or some area of interest that you think are quite good? And there are people out there who are curators of evidence. They exist. They, there are shops like the Coalition for Evidence-Based Policy, which is run by someone named John Barron, who has since moved to the Arnold Foundation. People uh, who, there's the Washington State Institute for Public Policy where they look at many, many different interventions and they try to create a cost analysis around them. Um, people who, who are in the business of helping other people make sense of research exist. And so very often, you it, go find these people, and make them your sources, and then ask for their help in making sense of their own or other people's research. Um, it, it will save you a ton of time and, 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 and very often, People will say, you know, there's a new study that just came out that's even better. The other thing that's available, although very few people use it, there's whole networks of researchers that produce what they call meta-studies or meta-analyses. There's something called the Cochrane Collaboration, which started in England 20 years ago, and still nobody knows about it. There's the Campbell Collaboration. These are researchers who, instead of looking at individual studies, they will look at 200 studies, put them together, and be able to come out with much stronger statements and findings than these individual studies, because these are called um, systematic reviews, is what they call them. A lot more people are doing them now because of this problem of publication bias. So there's a whole, for those of you who are nerds about research, there's a lot of great people out there in the research world who are trying to, to make it easier for journalists to understand it, because they know that this stuff sits on shelves and doesn't really get out there in proper ways. So, um, so, that, so I would say get, find and cultivate great sources who can stand between you and research. Yeah, good. Thank you very much for your, for your time.